right after our service this morning, uh, there's going to be a, a meeting downstairs in the lower auditorium to uh, do a brief report on the building projects that have been going on around the church for the last little while. And uh, we have undergone a lot of stuff in the last three and a half to four years. And uh, we've undergone, especially this year in particular, I think, may have been the year in which you've noticed the big amount of uh, construction going on. But it's really been going on for a long time. And I'm very thankful for all those who have participated and have supported uh, the projects as we've gone uh, about them. And I'm I'm very thankful for all that. I'll never forget the first time I came into this building. Uh, my impression was that this is a this is a beautiful building, um, and I, I've had the opportunity when friends or, or uh, visitors stop by to take people on tours of this facility. And and I've most of the time when people come into the sanctuary, they say, "Wow, this is a beautiful church." You, you just don't see, I, we see it week after week and we kind of can take it for granted, but churches like this uh, are just not being built anymore. And it's a, real, uh, it, it's a real beautiful place to be able to come and worship God on a regular basis. One of the things that I've learned over the course of the last three and a half or four years with all these projects is that you have to maintain it. Uh, Buildings like this require maintenance. And if you let that maintenance go, if you ignore problems and you don't deal with things over the years, then your problems get really big. And you have to do really big projects, which is what we've been involved with. And even if if you stay on top of all the maintenance, there's still projects that need to happen. And it's, it's a place that needs to be maintained. I think that's, that's true for uh, most buildings. Well, I think that's, anybody own a house? I think that's true for every building, right? But I think that's also true of our relationship with one another as Christians. You see, when we think of church in our mind, I, this happens to me all the time. When I think of church, I, my mind immediately goes to, I'm going to go to church And my mind is thinking of a building. But the reality is, is that when we, this is a building, it's not the church. The church is people. And just like a building, this is a wonderful privilege that we have to have this building to meet together every week. And just like this building needs to be maintained, so too do our relationships with one another as Christians need to be maintained. It's important. And that's what our text is about this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 10 through 17 this morning. And here, Paul gives us some important truths in maintaining our relationship with one another. One of the most important things that we need to think about as a church is being unified, being together, building unity with one another in the church. And the text that we're looking at this morning gives us some things. There's four things in this text that help us to maintain and build unity in the church. And the first thing that Paul talks about here is he talks about if we're going to maintain unity, that's going to require living like a family. If we're going to be together as a church, we need to understand the kind of relationship that we're supposed to have with one another as believers in Christ. Maintaining unity requires living like a family. Notice how the verse 10 begins. I appeal to you. I I make a plea to you. I'm urging you. I want this for you, believers. He says, I appeal to you. Notice what he says. Brothers. He uses that term again in verse 11. Brothers. In fact, if you 
look through the whole book of 1 Corinthians, Paul uses that word, brothers, to describe the church at Corinth 27 times. Almost twice a chapter, Paul is reminding the church that they are his brothers or that he thinks of them as his brothers. In other words, and I think, I think it would be right to translate that as brothers and sisters. I, I don't think he's just talking to the guys in the church. I think he's talking to the whole church all together. And he's saying, look, I think of you as family. You're my family. You're my brothers in Christ. You're my sisters in Christ. And if the implication of, that, of, of, of Paul's use of brothers is that the church, all, when he's thinking of the church, all Christians there, that they are brothers and sisters with him, the implication there then is that we're brothers and sisters with one another. Uh, anybody who has brothers and sisters knows that they can get on your nerves from time to time. But they're still your brother, right? They're still your sister. They can annoy they can annoy you to no end. They can steal your toy. Uh, they're still your brothers and sisters. You can't change that. You know, they, they say you, can't, uh, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. And a lot of us, I think, come from families where there's that one person you kind of wish you could. The exact same thing is true in the church. I cannot choose, you cannot choose who's a part of the church. Right? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you're a Christian, then you're part of the church. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're, we're family. And it's so important for us to have that perspective in our hearts if we're going to take this plea, this urging, this appeal that Paul is giving to the church. We need to know that it's rooted in the church being a family. I appeal to you brothers. Notice also, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, you're, you're my family, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he reminds us of our relationship with one another, that we're family, but he also reminds us of our relationship to Christ, that Jesus is our Lord. Lord King, the one who's in charge of us. Jesus is our Lord. And that's whom Paul is making the appeal in his name, in his authority, in the authority of Christ. I'm making this plea to you as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus is Lord. And it says, do you want me to answer it? We're, we're good? Okay. We'll just wait. It'll be okay. It's fine. No, you know what? Don't apologize. It gave me a chance to make a joke, and I don't always get those. So it's good. Um, what was I talking about? Philippians 2. Uh, Philippians 2 says that every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is what? That Jesus is Lord. You know, Jesus is Lord whether we like it or not. But as Christians, He's our Lord. In other words, we delight in, we rejoice in the rule of Christ. Imagine in your mind for a moment a kingdom where there is a brave knight. Anybody like stories, tales of... Uh, Knights that slay dragons and, and, and chivalry and, and, and medieval stuff. Anybody else with me on that? A few people. Okay, so imagine in your mind a kingdom where there is a brave knight. And the brave knight tries his utmost to live according to the laws and the desires that the king of the kingdom has established. Why? Because he loves the king. But also in the kingdom there is another knight who hates the king and wants nothing more than to uh, disobey the laws and go against the king and try and overthrow the king and become king himself. 
the first knight, the brave one who tries to do all that pleases the king, the king rewards and delights in. And that he is Lord of the brave knight. The second knight, because of his disobedience and rebellion, spends his life in the king's dungeon. See, he's Lord of both knights, right? The, 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 the evil knight can't overthrow the king because the king is Lord. That's, that's the way it is in the world with people and God. Jesus Christ is Lord, whether we like it or not. But as Christians, He's our Lord. In other words, we embrace it. We love it. We desire it. It's our joy that Jesus is our Lord. So we need to understand that the appeal that Paul is about to make to the church, the appeal that God is making to us this morning through His Word is rooted in the church realizing that we are a family under the Lordship of Christ. Maintaining unity requires living like a family, the family of God. That leads Paul into his plea. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Here's what we take from that verse is this, is that maintaining unity, being together, requires work. If we're complacent, if we're lazy about our relationship with one another, we're not going to be able to maintain unity. Maintaining unity requires work. The exhortation, the plea, is that we agree with one another. Now to get the picture of what Paul is driving at here, it's helpful. It gives us a deeper understanding if we look at the original language here. Because the original language, you could translate it another way. We could say that it means to speak the same things together. To speak the same things together. So to be unified, to be together, means talking with one another. Now remember that this is rooted in our relationship together as brothers and sisters in Christ under the Lordship of Christ. So I think what it's driving at here is it's saying that if we want to maintain, if you want to maintain unity in the church, you want to be together as believers in Christ, then we need to talk with one another, speak to one another with open Bibles, with a desire to end up at the same kind of speech, the same kind of language, agreeing with one another. We need to desire as individuals, not what we want, but what Christ wants in our life. But you see, we have have challenges as as we come to the Bible, open Bibles to talk with one another, because we all come to the Bible, I I include myself in this, we all come to the Bible with presuppositions and assumptions and desires of our own. We are all, I I heard a historian once talk about the culture that we live in as being a tyranny. We live in the tyranny of our culture. And what he meant by that is we're, we're prisoners of our culture. We're prisoners of our assumptions. We're prisoners of our upbringing. And we all come to the Bible with, 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 with presuppositions and, and we all see things in certain ways. And that creates problems for us getting to the right understanding of what the Bible says and what it teaches. I heard a pastor, I read rather, a pastor recently quoted as saying this, that the Bible is like a violin and you can play whatever tune you want. You understand what that means? It means that we bring what we want to see to the Bible and then we search the Scriptures and we superimpose our own worldview on the Bible and we say that the Bible says what we want it to say. That's what we mean when we say the Bible is like a violin that, that you can play any tune that you want upon it. And that, 
that's the culture, whether you, that's the culture that I have been raised in. That you decide what things mean. It, it doesn't matter. It, it, there is no such thing as truth. You get to decide. we need to think of the Bible in a different way. Rather than the Bible being a violin that we play the tune that we want, we should think of the Bible as a piece of sheet music written for an orchestra. Anybody ever been to see an orchestra before? They're wonderful. It's amazing. There are very few musical pieces that are as beautiful as as a full orchestra with all the instruments playing a piece of music together. But you need to realize when you go and you listen to an orchestra that the person playing the trumpet or the trombone or the saxophone or the violin or the oboe or the clarinet or any of the other instruments that are part of an orchestra, they're not playing whatever they want. Think about this. How many times would you go back to see an orchestra if you showed up and every instrument was playing whatever they felt like? Uh, You can hear that sometimes if you go to a high school music class. (laughs) Nobody's buying tickets for that. Nobody wants to go. What makes, what makes an orchestra beautiful, what makes that music beautiful, is they're all following the music that's written for their instrument. And when we come to the Bible, what our goal needs to be together is we need to be listeners. We need to be hearers. We need to sit before the Scriptures. We need to do the work of looking at history and reading what others think and talking to each other about uh, how we've seen and understood the Bible so that we might become hearers of the Word of God. That we might become listeners and then apply it. James says it's not good to just be hearers, but to be, what? Doers of the Word. So that we apply it to our lives rightly as God wants it to be applied to our lives. Not as we want it to be applied to our life. And you know what? That takes work. That takes work. Going through the exercise of getting together with open Bibles and talking about what God is saying in His Word, that takes effort. That takes work. We actually need to get together and we actually need to do that. It's not something that we can be complacent about. Now look at what happens if we're not willing to do that. So he says, Here's the plea that all of you may agree with one another, that is, speak the same things to each other, agree with one another, so that, here's why you do that, here's why you do that hard work, so that there may be no divisions among you. Here's what happens if we don't come together with a desire together to hear what the Bible has to say to us, not what we want it to say, but what it has to say, to, what God has to say to us through His Word. There's divisions. We become like an orchestra that is all playing their own music. Now, the word here that is used for division paints a picture in the original language. Here's what, it, here's, here's what it means in Greek. Is to take a piece of fabric and, and tear it in two. You see, if we, come, if we come together as a church and everybody wants to go their own way and do their own thing, and we can't agree together on what the Scriptures teach, that's what happens. You want, a, you want an example of that? Just read the book of Judges. The repeated, the repeated phrase through the book of Judges is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. How's that working for the Israelites in the book of Judges? Not good. Not good at all. But, here's the beautiful thing. Look at what it says next. So, he, he makes this plea so that there might not be any divisions among you and that... And that 
you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Those words, perfectly united, are a wonderful picture. It's the picture of a needle and thread stitching things together. I I brought this because I think this is a beautiful picture of what the church of Christ uh, is. I didn't make this, by the way. I was going to bring a needle and thread and do some stitches, but it was told to me that that would be dangerous, so I didn't. But look at, look at this quilt. And I've seen a number of my, my wife and my mother-in-law do a number of beautiful quilts like this. And look at all the different pieces of fabric here. They're all, they're all different. They're different shapes. They're different colors. They're different patterns. But here, uh, the maker of this quilt took a needle and thread, probably a sewing machine too, <laughs> and stitched them together to make this quilt. And that's what happens to us as we come together with open Bibles, speaking to one another, seeking to build unity in the church. We're all different. Every single, there's no two people the same in this room. We're all, we all have different stories. We all have different backgrounds, different families. Some of us have different skin colors. Some of us come from different uh, economic stratospheres. But the amazing thing in the church is that if we're willing to build, if we're willing to come together with open Bibles and hear what God has to say to each one of us, God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, stitches us together to make something beautiful. Like this quilt. That's amazing. But it takes work. It takes work. It takes effort. You know the best families? Uh, Some people think, uh, they look at their own family like, man, my family's messed up. I wish I was like the Joneses who live next door, who have two perfect kids who never do anything bad, and their their husband and wife, they just love each other. It's awesome, and you can just see how wonderful their relationship. I wish I, I mean, my kids never do what I say. My wife is always mad at me, and I just, that's not me, by the way. <laughs> Some things I, sometimes I say things, and then I realize what I said five seconds after I said it. And we can get, we can get the, I, I want that. I want that per, picture-perfect family. Well, you know how you get that kind of family? Work. I, I heard a pastor talk about marriages once, and he, he was talking about people envying other people's marriages, and he was saying how, you know, we always think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And, and he had this saying, it was awesome. He said, no, 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 no. The grass is greener where you water it. In other words, it takes work. If we're going to maintain unity, we need to do the hard work of open Bibles together, looking what God is saying to us, and then apply it to our life. You can't, we can't just know it. We have to do it as well. And there's two more things that Paul gives us in this verse. In the next few verses, we see that Paul argues that maintaining unity requires avoiding false divisions. Sometimes divisions can come up in a church, disagreements can come up in a church, and they're really circumstances that don't merit division. Maintaining unity requires avoiding false divisions. Look at verses 11 and 12. My brothers, speaking to all of them, my family, Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels, that is, disagreements among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. They were creating divisions in the church based on the teacher's that they were following. And I think, my guess is what was happening in the church is people were saying, you know what, if if you're not a follower of Paul, I mean, if you don't love Paul in every single way, I'm not even sure you're a Christian. Or, you know what, if, if, if you don't follow Paul, 
you don't listen to everything he says, or you don't love Paul in every way, then you're, you're not even a Christian. And the same is true with Apollos and Peter as well. Some people, some people were even using Christ to break off into groups and divide themselves in the church. They probably said something like, you know, being a Christian is all about uh, just, it's all, it's all about Jesus. So don't, don't worry about anything that Paul and Apollos is saying. It's just about you. And if you think, if you think it's about something else, then, then you're not even a Christian. They were creating divisions among themselves over these teachers. We don't have the details, but we know for sure that they were creating divisions among themselves by these teachers. Now, that is built on, I think, the, uh, it's built on the premise that somehow Paul and Apollos and Peter, or he's called Cephas here, it's his Aramaic, the Aramaic translation of his name, and Christ are about different things. That the gospel that Paul preaches, the teaching that Paul has, and the teaching that Peter has, and the teacher that Apollos has, and the teaching that Christ has, they're all different teachings. I think that's what, that's what created the division here. But, but that's not true. That can't be true. We know that when Paul uh, comes up against a teacher who's teaching another gospel, you can read this, jot these verses down, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. When Paul comes up against another teacher that's teaching something wrong, another gospel, he condemns it in the strongest of terms. But he doesn't do that with Peter. He doesn't do that with Apollos. He certainly doesn't do that with Jesus. It's a false division they've created in the church. We can do that in our lives. I have favorite Bible teachers. I love John Piper. He's a wonderful Bible teacher. I love to read the sermons of Charles Spurgeon. Uh, he's dead, so that's the only thing you can do is read his sermons. I, I, have, I have teachers that I love. And if you are uh, a, a Christian who's seeking to grow in your faith, I'm sure that you have teachers that you love. Now, if you come to me and say to me something like, you know, Pastor, uh, I just don't. John Piper just doesn't do it for me. And I say to you in response, and I say, well, if, if you don't like John Piper, his preaching or his teaching, then you're not even a Christian. Or how can you be so silly as to not love John Piper? I mean, what's your problem? Or, or, or you come to me and say, you know, I really love, you know who I love? I really love Charles Stanley. And I say back to you, ah, I mean, and Charles Stanley is a wonderful Bible teacher. If I were to say to you that, oh, why would you ever listen to... Th-? I'm create- What am I doing? I'm creating a false division. John Piper and Charles Stanley and a list of thousands of others are good Bible teachers. We ought not to create divisions based on our preference of who we like as our teacher. That, that, that's, I think, what was going on in the church at Christ, uh, the church at Corinth, and that's a false division. Now look at what Paul says in verse 13. He says, is Christ divided? The, he asks three questions. These are three rhetorical questions, and the answer to all of them is an emphatic no. Is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized into the name of Paul? No. Think about what you're doing Corinthians. Think about what you're doing, people at First Baptist Church. Christ is not divided. These are all good, gospel-believing, Christ-following teachers. Don't be divided by picking favorites like that. In fact, if you do that, what, what can Paul do for you? He can't do what Christ has done for you. Paul can't die for your sins. I can't die for your sins. Only Jesus can do that. Are you baptized into my name? Are you baptized into Paul's name? No, we're baptized into Jesus' name. Don't create false divisions. That that is so 
important for maintaining unity. Oftentimes, we can create problems where there are none. I'm guilty of that. And when that happens, we need to say that's wrong, and we need to turn away from that. If we're going to maintain unity, we need to avoid false divisions. And Paul says one more thing to us in these verses 14 through 17, and that is that maintaining unity requires good priorities. We need, we need to agree on the most important issues. Look at verses 14 through 17. Paul says something really strange here. I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. You have to appreciate that when Paul was ministering in Corinth, he was working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then preaching the gospel in the evenings in his spare time. And the church was growing, and people were getting baptized. And, and Paul was, when he says, I don't remember here, he's just saying, look, it was a busy time. I didn't baptize. All he knows for sure is he didn't baptize very many people. And the strange thing about it is, he says, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize very many people. I have never heard another pastor or preacher say that. We love to baptize people. We love to see churches grow. And we love to see people live in obedience to Christ and grow in their faith. We love it. It's a weird thing for Paul to say that he's happy that he didn't baptize many. I think we learn a couple of things from that. One of the things we learn is that Paul certainly must have delegated ministry tasks in the church when he was ministering there. The New Testament is really clear, especially through the book of Acts, that when a person gets saved, they get baptized almost immediately. Baptism is not something that happens down the road like you, you, you achieve a certain a level of spirituality, uh, you check off the ticket, and when you're good enough, you can be baptized. The picture of baptism is that you're not good enough, that you, by faith you've received Christ and you're washed clean of your sin. That needs to happen when you accept Christ or really close to it. So people in Corinth, if you go back to Acts chapter 18, you realize a lot of people were coming to Christ. A lot of people were being baptized. It's just that Paul wasn't doing the baptism, baptizing. He baptized a few, but not many. He left that to other people believers. And he says, as I look back, as he's seeing these divisions that are creeping up in the church, and he looks back on his mission, he's saying, I'm happy I didn't baptize a lot of people. Because he feels that if he had, it would have made the problem worse. Oh, I I was baptized by Paul. Who were you baptized by? Apollos. Oh, that's too bad. I don't even, I'm not even sure your baptism counts. It, you laugh, but I'm t- that stuff happens in churches today all the time. And it's an over, I think what's happening here is it shows that they had an overemphasis on baptism. Now, baptism is important. Don't misunderstand me. Baptism is important. But please understand that baptism flows out of the acceptation, the acceptation of the gospel. It is not the gospel itself. It is the fruit of the gospel. And so it is with everything. So it is with everything. We need to have that perspective. That's how Paul is trying to straighten out this situation. Get your heads on straight, people, brothers, my family. Have the right priorities. Baptism is important. Good works are important. Communion is important. All these things are critically important, but please understand that they're the fruit of the gospel, not the root of the gospel. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize. That's not the matter of first importance. But He sent me to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Everything flows out of the gospel. And when we abandon, when the church begins to abandon that first priority, and and I want to overemphasize this because I want you to hear me rightly, 
that if the gospel is only an intellectual thing and it's not, it doesn't result in fruit, then it's not the gospel that's preached here. It produces stuff. Baptism and good works and all those other things are important. They need to be a part of our, but they flow out of the gospel. When we make those things the gospel, when we make those things of first priority, this is what happens. The church gets torn apart. That's happened many times throughout the history of the church. But if a church has the gospel as its priority, as the foundation, then it will be bound together in unity. Why? Because the gospel is not about human wisdom or human power. It's about the power that comes from the cross of Christ. It's about the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as believers, being that needle and thread that stitches us together, makes us into a wonderful orchestra to play the sheet music of God for the glory of Christ. That's what we need. I want with all of my being, with all that I am, for this church to continue to grow. For you to move forward in your life and walk with Christ and for me to move forward in my life and walk with Christ and for us to do it together so that we can be the church here in Leamington for the glory of Christ. One of the things we need is unity in the church for that to happen. If we're going to have unity, we need to remember that we're a family. If we're going to have unity, we need to remember that it takes work. We need to get together, open Bibles, and talk and agree together as to what we're supposed to be about. If we're going to have unity in the church, we need to avoid false divisions. Don't make a mess where there isn't a mess to be had. And then finally, we need to have good priorities. We need to have the right priorities. We can do those things. We'll remain together and we can be the church for the glory of Christ here in Leamington. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for teaching these things to us. Plant them deep in our hearts. Plant them deep in my heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.